in southern Sweden, near the town of Shivik. An ancient stone tomb lay undisturbed for thousands of years. Horses refused to ride past it at twilight, and as recently as the 18th century, locals reported seeing barrow fires on top of the grave mound, a supernatural phenomenon associated with pagan beliefs about the spirits of the dead within the mounds. But what makes this Bronze Age burial really unique is what was found inside in the 1750s when the tomb was restored after having been plundered for building materials. Ten large slabs forming a kist nearly four meters long and eight of them had mysterious engravings on the interior which have been the subject of analysis for the last 270 years or so. It was assumed that this tomb once contained a great king and so it was named Kungagraven, the king's grave. I visited the tomb to see if I could learn what these ancient pictures mean. These are drawings of how the tomb appeared in 1780 when the kist was exposed. What we see on the outside today is a rather liberal modern reconstruction. The entrance is modelled on the famous Lion Gate of Mycenae in Greece, which is roughly contemporary to the Shivik grave, now known as Brederur. The real entrance may have looked different, but experts are certain the grave was open and accessible. My friend Marcus and I poured libations to the spirits of the dead before we entered the ancient tomb. People in the Nordic Bronze Age mainly wore woolen garments like this skirt and shirt. Linen was introduced to Scandinavia in the Iron Age and is much lighter for hot summer days, which is why Marcus and I are both wearing these Lithuanian linen trousers made by his company Ligo Gloria. The Barrow Cairn is about 78 metres in diameter, but just 3.5 metres tall. However, experts have claimed it was originally between 7 and 15 metres tall. The chamber itself measures only 13 foot long and 3 foot wide. Finds from within, including a sword pommel and a fibula, are dated between 1500 and 1100 BC. Little was found within because the tomb had been looted. Both cremated and unburned human remains have been found inside and around the kist, which have been carbon dated to a 700 or 600 year period in three phases. The oldest around 1400 BC and the last ending around 700 BC. This means the tomb was in continuous use for most of the Nordic Bronze Age. There are at least five, maybe eight people in total, and most of them were teenagers. The earliest two, who may have been deposited when the tomb was made, were teens, not some great king as previously believed. The genders are not known. Therefore, we must question the idea that this was a king's tomb. Why were mostly very young people selected to be buried here? And why just a few over 600 years? I believe they must have been individuals whose social significance pertained to their religious function. It is likely the tomb was never sealed, but remained open for use as it is today. Rock art from the Nordic Bronze Age is common in Scandinavia, but not in tombs, and this art is really special. Analysis of the images on the kist dates the artwork to period two of the Nordic Bronze Age, which is around 1400 to 1300 BC. So the art, the finds within the grave, and the carbon dated human remains all give us a clear date of around 1400 BC for the original construction of the tomb. This is one of the most remarkable artifacts, archaeological sites that we have from the Nordic Bronze Age. Here, Shivik, the king's grave in Scania in southern Sweden. The depictions here tell us so much about their religion and their way of life. We've got solar wheels two large ones on this side and on this, on this side as well too. They're both in pairs.
And then there's also a depiction of a Bronze Age chariot, at that time state-of-the-art technology. And it's two wheel, spoke, two spoke wheels, each of them with the, and the same solar format, like with a cross in it. And that indicates to me that this kind of symbol might have some relation to the chariot symbol. And we know from Indian texts that the chariot was a symbol of the sun. The only problem is that in Bronze Age Britain, a thousand years before this and more, in fact, before the spoke wheel chariot was even invented in Russia, you see the two solar wheel motif in the form of brooches in Britain and in Ireland. So it seems that these two solar wheels precede the invention of the spoke wheel chariot, but that they were conflated at a later date anyway. But if they are indeed solar wheels, as they've always been described, why are they in pairs? I can't tell you the answer to that. The chariot on slab seven is the most impressive of all the images, in my opinion. There are other similar depictions of chariots from the Nordic Bronze Age, including petroglyphs at Vilfara Stenen and Ørsteristningen, both dated to the Nordic Bronze Age. These chariot bits from a bog in Gallemorse, Denmark, date to around 4,000 years ago, making them among the oldest evidence of war chariots anywhere in the world. But the Trundholm chariot model, also from Denmark, is the best and most clear evidence of the horse and chariot's role in a solar Indo-European cult in Bronze Age Scandinavia. Therefore, the resemblance of the solar wheels to the chariot wheels is unlikely to be a coincidence. An Indian text called Shatapatha Pramana, dating to the 7th century BC, explicitly says that the chariot and sacrificial horses can represent the sun in a ritual context. But in an older Indian text, the Rig Veda, roughly contemporary to the Shivic tomb, which is only about 500 years after chariots were invented in Russia, uses the chariot in a prayer as a metaphor for a sacrifice. And in this prayer, the charioteer represents the sacrificial priest. The Nordic Bronze Age religion was related to the Bronze Age Indian religion, so we must consider whether the chariot here is also a symbol of a sacrifice. Laser scans of Slab 7 revealed previously unseen lines which represent bridles and reins. This chariot scene has been compared to an obvious contemporaneous parallel on this shaft grave stele from Mycenae in Greece. This means the imagery is pan-European, revealing shared religious motifs with another Indo-European culture over 1,000 miles to the south. This religious connection to the south may have been maintained through the cultural exchange facilitated by the trade of amber and wool, which made some Nordic Bronze Age kings very rich. The cardigan is a button-down woolen jumper modelled on the wool waistcoat worn by British officers during the Crimean War. The garment was named after Lord Cardigan, who famously led the charge of the Light Brigade at the Battle of Balaclava. This fetching example was made in Ireland from 100% merino wool, which is comfortable and durable. The premium quality is evident from the fine, close-knit stitches. It was made by the Swedish brand Legio Gloria, whose sports and casual clothing are all ethically produced here in Europe. They also produce this cosy Atlantic merino wool jumper from Ireland. For thousands of years, both our ancestors and their sheep have known about the unique properties of wool, which not only keeps you warm, but also keeps you dry. These high quality garments, and many others, are only available from the Legio Gloria webshop. Click the link in the description to browse their stock and equip yourself with everything you need to remain warm, comfortable and handsome this winter. Slab 7 also depicts armed warriors, and these are found on many Bronze Age rock carvings from Scandinavia. And it has beasts which appear to be wolves or perhaps hunting hounds. We can also reconstruct in Indo-European cosmology the idea of a dog or wolf as a psychopomp that leads the souls of the dead in the underworld. And that's still evident in the mythologies we have uh, surviving today, such as uh, the three-headed dog of Hades in Greek mythology, uh, Kerberos, and in uh, Norse mythology you have Garmr, 
uh, and other dogs of hell and in the uh, Indo-Iranic traditions there are also these four-eyed dogs of the underworld. More peculiar is the strange shape next to these, which through the aid of 3D scans and by comparing to other examples, we can identify as a kind of fish with barbels, a carp or a catfish. We can see a similar fish engraved on this Nordic Bronze Age spearhead from Val sur Magle in Denmark. There are also many stylized depictions of fish on Nordic Bronze Age razors, like this one from Murin in Denmark. Further away in Val Camonica in Italy, a great number of petroglyphs have been found, dated from the Stone Age to the Iron Age, including Bronze Age spearheads and solar signs like we see at Chivik. This depiction of a fish with barbels is very similar to the one at Chivik as well. The meaning of the fish in the context of warriors, hounds and a chariot is hard to interpret, but my own belief is that this represents a god who has taken the form of a fish. Indeed, there is evidence to show that the Nordic god Odin was sometimes depicted in a fish form, but that is a topic for another video. And there's many other things here that I can't fully explain. Two horses here, two horses below. These four animals on slab three are almost certainly horses, looking much like the horses pulling the chariot on slab seven. This is the earliest depiction of domestic horses in Northern Europe. As mentioned, there is good reason to connect the horse to solar symbolism and to understand it as a sacrificial beast of a solar cult. However, Karl Skoglund observed that horses do not appear as obvious cosmological symbols in Nordic artwork until later in the second part of the Nordic Bronze Age, shortly after Breda Rur was created. It is therefore possible the horses here are merely symbols of elite identity. But personally, I favour the solar explanation. The zigzag lines between the horses and solar wheels on slabs 3 and 4 have been interpreted as representing different planes of being, with the realm of the living in the centre and a celestial realm above through which the solar chariot travels. This is speculative, but it is certain that some important meaning was assigned to these images. And also, processions of hooded figures, perhaps involved in the funerary rites that were necessary for the creation of this grave. Some scholars have observed that the arrangement of the slabs indicates that the art depicts some kind of narrative, like a comic book, and that this could show a specific funeral event, such as the one for the two teens who were first laid to rest here. These spooky S-shaped figures appear to be people wearing ritual robes with hoods. There are eight of them on slab seven beneath the chariot, all facing a male figure. Perhaps they are souls of the dead approaching a god of the underworld. Or perhaps he is a priest and they are his students. Such robes would be handy when making a blood sacrifice, which could get messy. Some scholars think they look like birds or even seals. Christiansen and Larsen claimed in 2005 that the figures were derived from the same source as the four lion-headed donors depicted on this Mycenaean gold ring from Tyrins. However, this was dismissed by Nordquist and Whitaker, who pointed out that the figures on the Greek ring are approaching a seated female, while those at Chivik are following what seems to be a dancing man. And anyway, the figures don't even look that similar, so it was a very tenuous claim. We can more reasonably compare them to this more recent depiction of a procession of hooded figures on the Garda Borta picture stone from Gotland, which is dated to the 6th or 7th century AD. There are other Gotland stones with processions of warriors, and these three have been interpreted as representing the gods Odin, Thor and Freyr. There are nine more of these hooded figures on slab 8, all gathered around what could be a kist for a funeral. Maybe the Bred Rur kist itself. Or perhaps it is a cauldron containing sacrificial ablation. 
It has been compared to the images on a silver cauldron found in Denmark, but which was made by Celts in the Balkans, where we see what seem to be the souls of dead warriors approaching a cauldron into which they must be dipped prior to reincarnation. Above these hooded ones, we see men blowing bronze lures, a ritual instrument of the Nordic Bronze Age, which is depicted on other rock art in Sweden, such as on this boat in Tarnum. Thankfully, many actual lures have been recovered, especially from bogs in Denmark, and so they have been reconstructed and we know what they sounded like. To the left of the lure players, two men stand either side of what could be a double gong. Or is it some ritual structure from which are supported representations of the two suns we see depicted elsewhere? At the bottom of slab 8 stand eight male figures, three of whom are wearing brimmed hats. They face two omega sign shaped objects, the meaning of which is not clear. I like to see them as portals to the underworld, through which the dead must pass. There's also lots of depictions of axes. These two solar wheels are accompanied by Bronze Age axes, which are important symbols of war in their time, perhaps also pertaining to the thunder god of their Indo-European mythology. Probably it's going to be some kind of earlier version of Thor. These large ceremonial axes on slab one and six could represent axes used in blood sacrifices of the sort which might have been conducted as part of funerary rituals at the tomb. And also, there is, although can't really make it out very well, a depiction of a very pointed hat next to two axes. That pointed hat resembles artifacts found from Bronze Age Germany and France, these wonderful golden hats, very tall and pointy. Uh, it could be that they existed here in Scandinavia as well, and that would explain why one is depicted on one of the slabs of this tomb in this great barrow. The pointed hat on slab one isn't really visible anymore. However, it was well documented over the 18th and 19th centuries, as these sketches show. This print of the kist as it was in 1780 shows that slab 1 was exposed to the weather after excavation, which explains why the art is no longer visible. However, there are two more clearly visible hats on slab 2, and these are rounded rather than pointy, making them more like those worn by the men on slab 8. Like slab 1, slab 2 also has a depiction of a boat at the bottom. Perhaps the fact that the two slabs with boats also have hats is significant. Boats are one of the most commonly recurring motifs in Nordic Bronze Age art, and as I explained in my video about the stone boats of Scandinavia, the boat was most likely viewed as a vehicle for the dead to travel between worlds. This recent scan of the boat on slab 2 reveals that it has interned prows, which allows us to date it to the early period of the Nordic Bronze Age from 1550 to 1400 BC. But it is believed that the hats were carved more recently, since they are less weathered than the other images on this slab. And this means these hats probably weren't on the slab when the kist was first made. Torold and Andersson argued that these hats also resemble those worn by these two figurines from the Stockholm Horde found 56 miles north of Schivik, and which date to period 2 of the Nordic Bronze Age. Bertilsson and colleagues have also compared the hats to these shapes depicted on one of the rocks at Asperberget in Tarnum in Sweden, which are dated to the latest period of the Nordic Bronze Age, supporting the theory that the hats were added to slab 2 at a date long after construction. Evidently, the hats depicted on the slabs and elsewhere must have had a highly potent symbolic power, just like this stunning golden hat from Schifferstadt in Germany. They always remind me of the alchemist from Jodorowsky's Holy Mountain, and I imagine their meaning is just as esoteric as that film is.
The prevailing theories regarding the images in Brederur have interpreted them in relation to a solar cult. However, as far back as 1930, Veer Gordon Child compared the Greek author Strabo's description of a Teutonic priestess sacrificing prisoners of war to the images on the Shivik slabs. In 2022, Kalif and Östegård at Uppsala University in Sweden interpreted the entire Shivik tomb and all the images within as pertaining to the Indo-European wolf warrior cult of the Menabunda. The wolf warrior cult is found in numerous Indo-European religions, as well as in more recent folk practices all across Europe, where it is connected to agricultural seasons, particularly at Christmas time. It is also the source of the werewolf monster from European folklore. Teenage boys in Indo-European cultures would live like wild wolves outside of normal society, preying on other people, and would literally become the spirits of the great ancestors through midwinter rituals such as Yule. Archaeological and historical evidence show that this cult was just for teenage boys, and since most of the remains at Brederur are of teenagers, it is possible they were members of the roving wolf cult, and therefore their untimely deaths meant they became ancestors before they became adults. The cult involved roaming abroad, and so it is possible their cremated remains were brought back to Sweden from the places where they died, perhaps explaining the connections to Greece and Italy. So if we accept this theory, the seven robed figures would actually be wolf boys, following the man who leads their warband, known in Proto-Indo-European as the Koryos. The authors argue that the average of just one burial per century over a 600 year period can be explained since each young wolf boy was a potential leader of the people in the future. The loss of one future leader per century would have been a great blow to society, in particular if the deceased had attained divine status. The problem with this theory is we don't know the gender of the dead teens in Brederur, and we don't know what gender the robed figures are either. Preempting this criticism, the authors try to argue that even if the remains turn out to be of girls, maybe girls were allowed in this very masculine warband cult, citing the alleged warrior woman of Birka as a gender non-conforming person in the Viking Age. I can't say I'm convinced, and I already made a video criticising that interpretation of the Birka woman. Brederur is not a king's grave, as previously thought. It was the resting place of several teens. Since it is likely this tomb was open for 600 years, it might be better to think of it less as a grave and more like a temple. The esoteric imagery is hard to decipher, but it is loaded with potent religious symbolism pertaining to the sun, to war and to the dead. Some of the images are found on similar art elsewhere in Scandinavia, but some motifs appear to relate to contemporary art found in Greece and Italy, indicating influence from some kind of pan-European Bronze Age cult. In all likelihood, this was a place where people were able to make contact with the world of the dead, to appease the spirits of the great ancestors, and perhaps petition them for aid. These sorts of religious behaviours are found all over the world, and are also prominent in the pagan religion of Viking Age Scandinavia, which in all likelihood derived directly from the very Indo-European religion of the Nordic Bronze Age. I can only run this channel thanks to the generous contributions of conscientious patrons. I accept several cryptocurrencies and also one-time donations via PayPal, but if you want to get access to exclusive content, then please become a patron on Patreon or Subscribestar.